that healthcare information is cataloged or organized and described in those different information systems uh, basically in unique ways all over the place. And so we are more or less in um, a position of like uh, the biblical story about the Tower of Babel. Uh, and in the early origin story of Loink, the, the original paper described it like this. So in each case, these goals, these goals of information exchange, of sharing data from one system to another, uh, are stymied or delayed by the work and expense of translating this Babel-like proliferation of different codes that are used by different sources for the same tests. Uh, and this situation happens even when those source systems are complying with and using um, electronic messaging standards, meaning the format or the structure of the message could be the same and the computers could understand how the information was organized, but when you looked inside that structure of what the clinical content was, there were different codes, different identifiers, different labels for the same test, and that was um, essentially the primary problem uh, that, uh, that Link was trying to solve. Um, in addition, not only are they different uh, but they're often ambiguous and incomplete, meaning uh, when you just sort of look at the test name or the description of what that variable is, you didn't have enough information to know if it was really the same thing uh, as something else that you might have received from, uh, from, another, uh, from another source. So there's more uh, than meets the eye in terms of the, uh, um, the, the labels on information. Uh, and uh, this is the slide that I include uh, so that my three young boys think I have a cool job. Uh, and they can say, when Daddy's working, I can say, look, you know, I can put Optimus Prime in my, in my talk. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, so uh, back to, back to the main, main message here. So the fundamental challenge uh, is that local systems have different ways of identifying the same concept. And that things that look alike on the surface uh, aren't really the same if you, uh, if you dig in. So how do you solve that problem? Well, the solution really is to have um, uh, something uh, like um, a, uh, a, a converter, a universal language. And so, again, in that early paper uh, described like this, this problem uh, of uh, idiosyncratic codes colliding with each other uh, wouldn't exist if all the laboratories or substitute their laboratories for any data producer, any system that's collecting data, if we all use the same universal set of test identifiers when electronically uh, transmitting results. And, um, and so this solution is essentially what LONIC was designed to be. Uh, LONIC stands for uh, Logical Observation Identifiers, Names, and Codes. And it is designed to be this uh, universal code system facilitating exchange, pooling, and uh, processing of clinical data. Uh, it's organized and sort of uh, developed by the Reagan Street Institute, which, as I mentioned, is a nonprofit research organization here in Indianapolis, um, uh, USA. And the LONC work was initiated back in, in 1994. Uh, from then until this time, uh, Reagan Street has sort of served as the overall steward and owner of LONC, who develops it, licenses it uh, in a way that tries to promote widespread global adoption so that it can fulfill that ideal uh, of being a universal uh, a universal language. Um, over the 20 plus years that it's been around, LONC has been uh, supported financially from a number of different organizations. So people ask, you know, how is it that you can make LONC free? Um, and the answer is um, we have um, benefactors in some ways, uh, granting organizations, contracting organizations who funded us to, uh, to do this work. In particular, I want to call out the, uh, the U.S. National Library of Medicine which today is roughly two-thirds of LOINC's funding, and ha they have been funding LOINC continuously um, for a, a very long time, I think uh, 15, maybe 20 of, those, uh, 20 of those years. So what is LOINC? LOINC is, in a nutshell, this universal code system uh, for tests, measurements, and observations. And when I try to translate that into sort of uh, normal language, uh, I say things like LOINC is trying to make health data more fluid uh, and understandable to different computer systems. Uh, so computer systems by different vendors, computer systems in sort of different care settings, just different computer systems. Lunch job is to help make health data uh, understandable. It's kind of like a barcode. Um, the idea being uh, it's, a, it's a label, it's an identifier that follows a particular test result from production to, um, 
the, the main recipient, which might be a hospital system or a um, uh, electronic medical record system for an office provider, um, but it sort of stay, it can stay with that data and uh, be used to identify it, whether you're doing secondary use, like sending that on to public health uh, for reporting or for data analytics or for sending to a disease registry. Um, wherever that information goes, it can still have that unique barcode, that unique identifier that each system that needs to do something with it can, can understand. That's the idea. Uh, I like to say uh, that LOINC is free, but it's invaluable. Uh, meaning uh, it's no cost to get it, but provides um, a lot of value to, uh, to users of it who can build on top of uh, the knowledge uh, that, it, that it enables. So uh, what, what do you get? So the, you heard about the problem, you heard about the solution, what, what's the idea, what do you get? Well, um, the idea is that you get systems that can integrate data with high fidelity, right? Um, you don't want sort of degraded signal uh, or you want to minimize the degradation of the signal from the production where there might be a lot of fidelity to downstream recipients of that information. You want to sort of preserve um, a, an appropriate level of fidelity um, along the way. And you want data when and where you need it. That is, you want to enable it to move from place uh, to place. And ultimately, you want computers that can understand the content and can help uh, humans uh, make use of it. Uh, so humans as providers, clinicians, consumers uh, of healthcare. One's focus is, uh, as I've kind of conceptualized it, described it here, uh, narrow-ish ish, uh, on purpose. Uh, we're focused on measurements, things that you can test, measure, or observe. There are a lot of other things in healthcare and biomedical sciences that also might benefit from coding, standard coding, uh, but our focus is intentionally on this, this set of uh, things that you can measure or observe. And so we categorize uh, LOINC into two big categories, laboratory and clinical. Uh, and the laboratory has kind of been the, the, the predominant collection of codes in the database. And you can think of it as anything that you would test, measure, or observe on a specimen that you would take out of a person. It covers all the categories that are normally associated with uh, clinical laboratory uh, medicine, clinical laboratory science, um, chemistry, microbiology, algae testing, genetics, uh, and so forth. Um, roughly, uh, here's the breakdown of number of codes that we have in these different areas. I didn't update this for the most recent version, but the, the general pattern would hold um, here. And you can sort of see that there's good coverage, lots of codes in all the categories that you might normally associate with, uh, with laboratory testing. But uh, in contrast to what many people might think, LOINC is just for lab. Uh, it never was just for lab. Uh, it was always kind of this idea of um, observations or measurements in general. And uh, there's this portion of LOINC that we call clinical LOINC, which essentially is anything else uh, that's not lab. So clinical LOINC would be things that you could measure on a person, on a population uh, or even, um, say, uh, a setting on a machine, like a ventilator setting. Uh, that all falls into the scope of clinical loins. So in some ways, it's a much, much broader uh, set of possibilities. Uh, it's also, in many cases, less well um, standardized or, or um, captured as discrete data elements, a little bit more sort of free range in a lot of the areas. but. Uh, you'll see many small areas that one has um, coverage in, for example, vital signs, measurements you would make on cardiac ultrasound or OB ultrasound, uh, radiology um, uh, procedures, the large effort we have, there, as well as other document titles um, and uh, survey instruments, patient assessment instruments is a, is a huge kind of growth, uh, growth area. It has been for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, EKG measurements, all sorts of things like that fit into this idea of clinical LOINC. So LOINC does tests and measures. Um, one way to think about that or, or another way to conceptualize this is uh, to think of questions and answers. So if an observation is a question and the observation is the observation value is the answer, question, answer, LOINC's primary business, primary role um, our main focus is on making codes that represent questions. Uh, where needed, 
we typically uh, leave it up to other vocabularies or other syntaxes to provide uh, codes for the answers. As we go along, we'll actually talk about sort of the intersection and where LOINC is kind of in the, the, the answer space, but our main focus is on uh, our main focus is on questions. So questions, like for example, if you think of kind of from a laboratory perspective, a question like, well, does my patient, the patient have HIV? Does the sample have HIV? Muted. Right? The test is maybe looking for the presence of um, one of uh, antibodies for one of these uh, three uh, HIV subtypes. And it's kind of represented that question as positive or negative, it answers that question uh, of yes or no. Or you might uh, think of a question in a different way, sort of phrasing from a human perspective might be, is, is uh, my, patient, my HIV patient's immune system responding well to ART? Uh, and that can be represented in some ways uh, as a measure of uh, CD4 count uh, in, uh, in blood. And so once creating a code and a structured name for identifying that question, which is essentially what's the CD4 count like uh, in, this, in this sample. But translate that also uh, in your mind from a, a broader clinical context. So you might be asking questions, like for myself as a physical therapist, I might ask, well, how, much, how fast does my patient usually walk? That too is an observation, something that can be quantified, um, observed, and recorded in their record. And so Loink would create a code that might represent something like a one-week average walking speed, which would be the uh, explicit representation of this general question. Um, how fast does my patient usually walk? So Loink provides codes for questions. How does that work? How does that translate into electronic data exchange between systems? So the prevailing pattern for sending electronic data from one place to another in healthcare uses message standards such as those produced by HL7. Um, HL7 version 2 has been around and it's uh, probably the prevailing way laboratory data is communicated from a laboratory information system to a, a and so LOINC was designed and actually on purpose fits perfectly in this message structure context. So I pulled out sort of a sample of reporting a result in an OBX segment, OBX meaning observation, uh, to show you sort of where it fits. So HL7, if you know about HL7, you can close your eyes for a second. If you've never seen it before and you're like, what? Uh, I'll, you know, brief, brief tour here, right? Uh, demystify it a little bit. So it's kind of like a database. The fields are delimited by these vertical bars. Inside of a field that's delimited by these vertical bars is, is supposed to be a particular kind of information. There's a definition for what goes in each slot, each field. Um, and so uh, the slot, the first slot there, where you see the value of CE, that represents the data type and it says it's a coded element um, which tells the receiving system, oh, when I look over in the result value field, I'm expecting a code as opposed to just a number, an integer, string, uh, big old blob of text or something. Uh, and then the next field over is the, the uh, in the OBX3 field is the observation identifier slot. And this is precisely the place in the message where LUNC is designed to fit. It provides a code and a name uh, that says what the heck this thing is. And in this case, I'm using an example of reporting um, a blood culture. So LOINC um, provides the code that's identifying what the observation is. This is a blood culture. And then if you sort of go on, you'll find later in the message the actual result value, the instance for this particular patient, what's to be found on this culture. And here you see another identifier, the answer identifier, um, which is um, meningococcus, you know, trouble, <laughs> bad. Uh, and that role is being fulfilled by SNOMED in this case. So SNOMED is providing the codes that identify um, the organism. LOINC is providing the codes that identify the observation, the test, the culture. Okay? So in this context, you see how LOINC was designed and works very well with other standards. So other standards like HL7 as a message construct, other vocabulary standards, in this case SNOMED could be uh, in genetics you might see uh, ISCN or HTVS syntax or some other ways to represent answers, things that might be values. But one's role is to sort of fit inside that to put together the pieces that allow us to communicate. Of course, uh, you don't always need code uh, to communicate the results. And so I just wanted to show, um, to highlight uh, what it looks like for a numeric result, right? Same exact thing, I sort of stripped things down, except when you look over uh, at the data type, you see, okay, NM, this is numeric. 
which means the answer is going to be um, numeric value. If I look over there, you see that slot now has a result value, 4.86, and um, associated units of measure um, that go along with it. So again, Loink's role is to fill the spot of identifying what the measurement is, or a blood cell count, um, a blood culture, and there are other ways to communicate other kinds of information and so forth. But the actual structure, that is this version two structure, uh, doesn't really matter. Like Loink doesn't only work in this case. Uh, it works in any message Muted. It's using this name value pair uh, paradigm, which is the predominant way health data is, is transmitted. So here's an example of HL7's new standard fire, um, which is uh, sort of JSON or XML. Uh, so you see exactly the same pattern uh, holding up, and you see um, a, a place to record a code that's identifying the the uh, the observation, and you see a place to put the value, and you see a place to put units of measure and you see all these other sort of the same thing just sort of in a different, a different format. So Lonk works fine, HL7 Muted. A or other V3 standards, FHIR, um, or any other syntax that has sort of the same general form. I've mentioned um, focuses on uh, observations, tests, measurements, and Lonk creates codes obviously for individual observations, so things like white blood cell count, red blood cell count, hematocrits, uh, what have you. But one also creates codes for collections of observations. Generally speaking, we call them panels. We're going to talk about panels more later uh, in the day. Hang with me. Um, but just think, them, think of them as collections of information. And it might be a, a CBC, or it might be a collection of vital signs, or it might be a collection like the set of questions on the PHQ-9. Um, but Lunk also creates codes to represent that collector item and hook up the individual elements that go along with it uh, as well. So codes for individual observations, codes for collections. Um, you might be thinking, man, I love my local codes. What are you saying? Like, I got to give up my local codes for Lunk codes? Uh, to which I would say just muted. I have to give them up. Uh, and in all of our sort of communication paradigms that I've talked about, the various flavors of, of HL7 and so forth, um, you can transmit your local code along with uh, the one code just fine. And actually, that's a great idea. Uh, we actually recommend it as best practice. It helps make this connection. So standard codes don't um, uh, displace or replace necessarily the need for local codes in a lot of different contexts. And you can always, in these paradigms, communicate both. And we think that's a great idea. So here you see that that OBX3, that place where I put an observation identifier, has two sets of triplets that you can stick in there. Uh, one can be your local code. Uh, one can be the link code. And they can serve different roles. So uh, you can trigger off of one or the other. You can have the display name for your system. Might, you might want to use your hospital ID for it, but for competing purposes, use the link identifier and so forth, and that's all well, good, uh, and lovely. So um, if maintaining your local dictionary is your favorite thing, uh, you don't necessarily have to give up that job and just do link stuff. All right, uh, one more thing. What's with the pig? Uh, so uh, you might see a lot of pigs uh, around here, occasionally in the slides, uh, and uh, on our Twitter avatar, various places, and uh, it's more just for fun. Uh, so if you don't like pigs, you know, smile, or nod. <laughs> um, uh, my grandfather was a farmer and he raised hogs, so it's, it's all great with me. Um, basically, loink sounds like oink, therefore we like pigs. <laughs> that's that's sort of how it works. Um, and uh, so it's our unofficial official mascot, uh, and uh, it sort of appeals to our uh, Midwestern sensibilities. Um, uh, which reflect Loink's, uh, Loink's heritage. So, Loink, uh, let me give you a flavor of, of where uh, Loink is uh, today in, in, in healthcare sort of around the world. So while it may have sort of originated here, its, its goal uh, would never have been met if it was just sort of used in a couple of hospitals in Indiana. It was always meant to be sort of this universal identifier. So um, the Clem phrased it like this uh, in a paper uh, a while back, it said, you know, data standards like Loink or even like HL7 are like telephones. They require this critical mass of users before they come useful. If you're the only person with a telephone, it's not that helpful. But when every person on the planet 
as a telephone, it's a lot more useful of a tool to have around. And the same thing is true with LOINC. If you're, if you're the only person that has LOINC codes, it doesn't really buy you much. Um, maybe a little, but not much. But when lots of people have it, um, and you can use it as a universal language, then um, that's a, a much better situation. So while it sounds, to be honest, kind of crazy, uh, a little audacious, um, our, our vision, though, is actually that LOINC is integrated everywhere that clinical information systems need to share or aggregate data because that would have the most value, the most impact, um, and so forth. So anywhere there's tests or measurements being passed around, we'd like to see, uh, we'd like to see LOINC codes. Um, today, there are users uh, who've created accounts on a website registered with us from uh, 172 countries, uh, roughly 44,000 of them, and that number keeps growing. This uh, graph shows the trend in number of registered users over time. Since we started uh, uh, requiring it for certain purposes back in 2008, um, this grows roughly at um, about 6,000 uh, new users each year. On the, uh, the LOINC website, there's an international page which highlights um, some of the, uh, the activities in translation, and uh, this is a screenshot from that page. Roughly, uh, I think there are now 18 variants of 12 languages uh, that have translated LOINC into these uh, dialects. We call them linguistic variants. We'll talk about how you can use them in Realm of later on today. Um, but essentially, we allow uh, support multiple dialects for the same language sort of by country. So there are um, a couple of French translations, uh, for example, one from Canada, one from France, um, from Belgium, and so forth, multiple Spanish translations as well um, to serve uh, different purposes, different needs uh, within those, uh, those countries that are adopting LOINC. So um, uh, translations into 12 different uh, languages, and that sort of helps uh, us become this global lingua franca. That's kind of always been the idea. At a national level, LOINC has been adopted by 28 to 30 uh, countries. Um, and uh, this is uh, countries that have uh, named LOINC in regulation or used LOINC in a... Did this go off? Okay. I think it muted and then it came back on. Um, uh, that have used LOINC in a national uh, healthcare program in, in one fashion or another have mandated this, about 28 to 30 uh, countries. But in addition to sort of national adoption, there are many, many large implementations around the world uh, that are using LOINC. I've listed uh, just a handful of them here. Uh, tomorrow you might hear about a couple more of them. Uh, uh, for example, regional health information exchanges uh, in Brazil, uh, in Canada, um, many in Spain and in Italy, uh, around uh, the U.S., the Hong Kong Hospital Authority, which is um, the, uh, the, the public uh, healthcare uh, service arm in Hong Kong, uh, and many, uh, many, many places. There are also uh, a number of sort of key adoptions uh, that I, I mentioned sort of outside of specific healthcare organizations, um, all of the large uh, referral laboratories uh, the big labs, uh, reference laboratories uh, in the U.S. have been key launch supporters from the very, very beginning. Um, most have had committee members sort of all along and regularly participate and help uh, inform what we're doing. And they uh, also mostly now all publish launch codes corresponding to their test codes uh, on their websites. Lots of different care organizations. Uh, as far as I know, all of the health information exchange networks for sure in the U.S. and, and and many other places are using LOINC. And increasingly, we see uh, uh, LOINC being used by insurance companies as um, for care management purposes, for receiving uh, data on their beneficiaries, um, EHR vendors. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, the fun and exciting sort of trend that we're, we're seeing happen is uh, in uh, use of LOINC uh, by instrument manufacturers, um, which is, I would still maybe categorized a little bit as nascent, but uh, is increasing, and, uh, and uh, we're thankful to have some representation here, and this is one of the areas that we've sort of always had in mind as a key goal, as they represented a point way far upstream in the data uh, exchange process. If you can get sort of standardization kind of up there, then everyone downstream benefits from it, and it makes the job of mapping to LOINC easier um, when you can start sort of at the instrument test kit level 
um, with kind of a narrower list of link codes. We'll, we'll say more about that in a second. Um, so just a, a couple of examples here uh, where LOINC is being used. So this is a nice paper that came out uh, 2013 describing the use of LOINC in the, uh, the Paris uh, APHP system. They describe uh, how they set up um, a, 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 essentially a local dictionary that was aligned with MAP2 and informed by the, the sort of principles that, uh, that LOINC uses. And that um, uh, was, yeah, their, their message was, it worked. Um, here's uh, members of the Korean National Standards Committee um, who've been linking uh, for a while. Uh, here's some very, very serious linking uh, going on in, uh, in Hong Kong. Here's much less serious linking <laughs> happening on street corners around, uh, we call this ad hoc linking. Um, there's uh, uh, us talking about link with the Thai Ministry of, of Information and Communication Technology. Um, this is uh, Muted. a LOINC workshop in, uh, in Cyprus. They've um, uh, adopted LOINC uh, quite extensively there. Uh, there's good support for LOINC at the Ministry of Health in, in, uh, in Malaysia. And we were excited earlier this year um, when a French law was passed uh, that uh, mandated LOINC for identifying lab tests um, uh, for communicating results uh, via this uh, IHEXD lab uh, profile. Um, so that was, I think, uh, February of uh, 2016 that came out. Similarly, um, there's a, uh, a national adoption in Italy uh, that, uh, that names LOINC for communicating lab test results. And also in, um, this is a, a nice little letter from the Supreme Council of Health in the state of Qatar, uh, or Qatar that uh, has adopted LOINC and made it uh, mandatory for communicating uh, lab test results. But you'll see LOINC in lots of other places. So increasingly, as I mentioned, uh, instrument manufacturers are looking to um, help their customers, who are the ones, of course, that they're paying attention to when they ask for LOINC they want to be responsive to uh, their customers' laboratories. Uh, and so they are, uh, in various ways, uh, making this information available commonly. Um, you'll see these as kind of add-on documentation reference material that might uh, be published on their website. So um, here's uh, something from Abbott about the, uh, the ISTAT, um, which kind of lays out the link codes um, that you might uh, be looking for if you're doing testing with the ISTAT machine. Uh, similarly, here's um, a specification document from Beckman Coulter for one of their hematology analyzers. If you take a peek in the back, they've got kind of this listing of um, link codes that correspond to uh, the test uh, result things that come out of that. Um, and as I mentioned, most of the big, the big vendors these days, uh, if you poke around, if you ask, if you go through various channels, you'll find something like this. So here's uh, a place on Roche's website. And uh, for many of their instruments or uh, their, their kits, you can find some kind of a link listing uh, documentation that, that has it. So, so we'll get to in a second. This is a great place to start um, and I uh, would encourage you to sort of continue to be poking at and um, asking for, looking for this kind of information from them. Uh, in addition, we are very pleased to be working very closely with Biomuro. Um, uh, they have some, uh, some representatives here. Uh, partnership to, um, to help um, identify link codes for the, uh, the tests um, that, uh, that they market, and uh, they've been um, enthusiastic and early adopters uh, of LOINC, and uh, we've been working with them quite closely now for, for um, a year and a half or so. Now, in the United States, um, many people are tuning in to LOINC um, against the backdrop of this federal incentive program called Meaningful Use, uh, which has gotten a lot of attention, caused a lot of things to happen, uh, and uh, as you know, it's, it's sort of been organized into these three stages. We're sort of now into this um, uh, part where the stage three uh, regulations have come out. And it sort of started a, a while ago. And the sort of um, the idea was that there would be sort of progressive, progressive requirements of data standards for the certified systems that healthcare providers and hospitals use. Uh, and the certification process is where those systems have to comply with and demonstrate that they use in valid ways information standards 
like HL7 uh, and vocabulary standards like LOINC. And so um, just as a sort of brief summary of, of, of where LOINC fits in, so out of the stage two uh, set of things, uh, criteria um, for certification, LOINC had a role in a variety of different uh, use cases, including transmitting data to third parties, sending cancer cases to state registries, sending and receiving electronic lab results, doing care summaries, um, sending reportable lab results to public health, uh, and so forth. And while it may not have been completely obvious how one got fit in, sometimes it was sort of by proxy of, of the regulation name for the implementation guide, which then inside the implementation guide had muted players you would use. So, for example, if you looked at the uh, lab reporting to EHR guide, uh, that was named in that uh, stage two piece, uh, and then look at what does it say about populating those OBX3 values. Um, you'll notice that it says, you know, LOINC should be used as the standard code for this field uh, if there's an appropriate LOINC code uh, there. So basically it's saying if there's a LOINC code that matches the test that you're doing, we should put a LOINC code there to be the standard code. Um, and uh, so inside of uh, those implementation guides are references to using uh, terminology. There's also, uh, out of the Meaningful Use program, there's sort of the certification piece and then there's the attestation about um, how we're using that technology, demonstrating that we're actually using it in so-called meaningful ways. Part of that is this whole sort of quality assessment, quality reporting paradigm. And inside the quality measurement piece is another place where standardized uh, terminology comes to pass. So this is um, a letter from the uh, HIT Standards Committee that talks about um, Muted. Electronic quality measure rules, how do you define those? And in lots of different cases, um, they named and adopted LOINC for various tests and measures. So essentially anywhere you could think of, you know, uh, where you want an observation code, they said, you know, use LOINC for the observation code and other, other vocabularies you might fulfill uh, those roles of the, the responses to those. But for non-lab for non diagnostic studies or functional status, um, uh, things about uh, patient characteristics, family history, where you're recording those as discrete data elements, um, LOINC uh, is the sort of preferred primary vocabulary for that, for that space. So how does it work in a quality measure? Let me just give you sort of a simple lab uh, example. You know, you might define a quality measure around um, uh, diabetes and measuring um, the percent of patients that are not doing so well with their hemoglobin A1C levels. And so your rule might be something about like, the, the, the percent of patients of a certain age who have diabetes who had a hemoglobin A1C greater than a certain value during this quality reporting period, this measurement period. Um, and so it would be nice if you could run a computer program that would calculate this for you rather than hand tallying them, uh, having the clerk uh, do it, which unfortunately for a lot of the rules that's sort of how they end up getting done. But um, the idea is that if you could execute these against your record system, life would be a lot easier. And so uh, if your task was finding all the hemoglobin A1C measurements in your, uh, your record system, you could do that by looking for a certain list of one codes. Uh, so this is a list of, uh, of one codes that might uh, fulfill that particular uh, quality measure. So uh, Meaningful Use Stage 3 has come out. This was uh, October, is that what it was? Yes, October last year. Um, there were a lot of different uh, mentions of LOINC, um, some in vain, no, just kidding, <laughs> it cursed us, no. Um, uh, but uh, let me give you sort of the highlight of what changed from stage two to stage three. So um, they ended up not adopting some criteria uh, that they had in the past, including some stuff around uh, transmitting uh, lab test results. Um, and I'll show their explanation, which is a little bit weird. Um, and I won't go off on a rant about this, I promise. Uh, but basically they were saying that uh, they somehow, uh, sometimes they did not adopt things that were adopted previously uh, because the current versions of these things were, uh, they deemed sort of not sufficiently ready. Uh, or in other cases they felt like uh, everybody was already doing it, so why do we need it to be um, sort of a, a mandatory certification thing. Um, but some of the areas where we were hoping that uh, we'd try to make some progress on as far as getting health data flowing uh, in, uh, in a standardized way that they didn't do much about were, was the ordering side, both diagnostic imaging studies and uh, uh, 
uh, laboratory test ordering. It did revise a number of criteria from the previous one. I've highlighted or bolded uh, some of the, the areas where there's kind of special uh, LOINC uh, related stuff uh, in there, uh, quality measurements and so forth, transitions of care. And then they added a number of uh, new criteria to the list from uh, 2014. And actually a couple of these uh, have special interest of LOINC in, in particular um, one of them is the, the social, psychological, and uh, behavioral uh, data area. So this is things that typically would fall into the clinical LOINC domain, clinical LOINC category, things around uh, financial research strain, stress, depression, uh, and so forth, and uh, sort of stimulated in large part by um, an IOM report and growing in interest from the community uh, in recording this data, um, they, they added this as one of the the, um, the certification criteria uh, possibilities, and actually in this way, they identify specific link codes for all of these different uh, domains that would serve as sort of a minimum set of things that you might collect. Uh, and so there's actually this listing of uh, link codes that you can find that sort of lay out uh, the variables for recording um, those, uh, those data elements. Um, one of the latest inventions of the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT in the U.S. Um, is uh, this document called the Interoperability Standards Advisory. The Standards Advisory, or the ISA as it's called, uh, if you like acronyms and can keep up with them, uh, the ISA uh, is meant to be, um, I think that's the word, is pre-regulatory. It's not a regulatory document, but it's meant to kind of lay out what ONC thinks of as the best available standards and implementation specifications. The anticipation is that things might appear on this list before they end up in regulation, and part of appearing on this list gives some visibility and allows for some discussion to happen in advance of um, it just appearing in regulation. That seems like a good idea. There's other kind of impl impl uh, implications of, uh, of this document, uh, whether for procurement or what, what have you, but um, uh, regardless of all those things, uh, it exists and uh, named like for a couple of things as the best available terminology standard for things like lab tests, uh, vital signs, and uh, radiology reports, and maybe in the next round um, will be more. There's a number of things kind of cooking on its possibility list uh, for 2017. Um, that we'll see uh, what, what happens with, but includes uh, other kinds of clinical measurements and so forth, including nursing. Last year, uh, we saw a lot of interest uh, in LOINC uh, from the FDA, and I'll highlight just a couple of key, key things. This, this is, uh, I think, a good progress. So it started off, um, LOINC was muted, uh, break, uh, recognized standards. That's kind of like step one in, in um, in FDA land for, for standards as to getting on their list. And then uh, they actually published uh, guidance for um, uh, study sponsors who were uh, sending clinical lab test results uh, to the FDA for clinical trials. Um, to They were encouraging the use of LOINC um, for identifying those uh, lab test results. And there was, uh, this was put out as guidance and there was um, there's a request for comments, and there's a bunch of comments that I think are, are available publicly, but sort of signaled their uh, encouragement and direction uh, around using LOINC uh, for this. In the fall, they held a, uh, a meeting that uh, many of you either listened in on or if you know, a few of you were, uh, were there um, around, uh, this is co-hosted by the FDA, CDC, and NLM, around the general topic of promoting semantic interoperability of lab data. Um, with a particular focus on, um, uh, you know, data standards uh, like LOINC, and I think um, the, the, the general sentiment was um, they would like to encourage uh, this, and we'll sort of see what specific steps come out of it. Um, but it was a nice, uh, it was a nice forum, and, and uh, they've continued to act on and discuss, percolate on the feedback that they got from that meeting uh, since, uh, since then. And earlier uh, this year, they also put out uh, draft guidance to um, uh, companies that were um, doing uh, uh, submissions for 
uh, medical devices, and it's called sort of design considerations and pre-market submission recommendations uh, for interoperable medical devices. And my sort of layman's summary of this is they um, they encouraged uh, people who are submitting medical devices to describe the interfaces if there are interfaces out of the device um, and uh, characterize them and sort of they indicate a preference for use of consensus-based standards for the interfaces for devices. And that would, while they didn't name specific standards, they're sort of setting a stage for um, we, we think it's a good idea in your submission to pay attention to these interfaces and consensus-based designed ones uh, are sort of the preference. So I, I, I'm not sure exactly um, but I, where this will go, but I think there's sort of a direction or a path um, of, of interest from the FDA. The, um, the American Nurses Association also last year uh, uh, got it. Excellent. Thank you. So a comment from the audience here um, from Cindy was that uh, the FDA is um, uh, planning a follow-up meeting to the one that they had uh, this year, probably uh, November. Um, so um, keep an eye out. Uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, so the ANA last year came out with a position statement around uh, the use of uh, data standards like uh, LOINC and SNOMED CT for communication uh, between healthcare providers. And so, um, as you know, there are many um, nursing specific terminologies in existence and use in various ways. And uh, this ANA position statement was significant because um, they're sort of recognizing this value, this direction of, of using sort of standards that cross settings well. Uh, and, uh, and cross care professional domains of expertise well. And so using Wallink and SNOMED um, for um, things like consolidated CDA transmission uh, is, is, a, is their recommended uh, path. And so um, we'll, if you're interested more in the nursing side, you know, join our clinical link uh, side and we have lots of good discussion um, and actually a separate uh, subcommittee headed up by Susan Matney around uh, nursing uh, nursing like stuff. And then, um, I don't know, if you know much about LUNC, there's a lot of jobs uh, out there. You might already know this. I don't know if you're looking for a job or not. Uh, but uh, I just went to this website and typed in LUNC and there were like 77 hits. This was last week or something. Uh, so apparently uh, it's a skill that people um, are interested in having. Um, my friends think this part is cool. You know, they, they, they know I might do something with computers and healthcare stuff, um, but uh, it's really cool when I can show them my iPhone and say, oh, you know that health thing where I can track my heart rate and my weight and my blood pressure? When I go to export that, if I choose uh, the consolidated CDA format from the little menu there, my iPhone spits out one codes. They're like, oh, I see, yeah. So there are one codes in there, sweet. You know, uh, and uh, you know. So what I, I guess I and I actually didn't know this. Uh, it was by accident that I discovered it, and, and that actually happens a fair a fair bit. Um, that many of the things that um, the adoptions that are interesting and fun and are you know, great to hear about are sort of unexpected. Um, and I can wrap all of that up by simply saying that uh, everyone loves Loink, uh, uh, including um, young children. <laughs> So, so let me spend a moment here to uh, talk about what is in um, what is in like what actually when I talk about like what what am I actually describing? So um, the link distribution or the the standard itself consists of a number of uh, tables, um, files, tools, and other kinds of resources, and I'll just kind of highlight them here for a moment. So we publish link uh, twice per year in June and December, like clockwork, every June, every December, you know, you can plan your vacation around it. No, actually don't do that. Um, uh, we, we, we put out releases that correspond roughly to when we hold these lab meetings. As I mentioned, we have some of this beta period and then the formal release later in the month. Um, and uh, we've been doing that for um, a long time. Uh, not always, but, uh, but for a long time. This graph shows you over time 
the growth in the content of the database since the very, very first release back in uh, April of 1995. So the top line represents all the codes in the database. So now uh, 79,000-ish uh, codes in there. And the orange proportion represents the set of the codes that are laboratory terms, and the blue would be that proportion that is uh, clinical content. And uh, this is muted to one-third. Uh, so roughly two-thirds of the content is lab, one-third is uh, clinical content. Uh, but as you can see, that split kind of on the clinical side has been growing a little bit wider uh, in, recent, in recent years. Um, you'll also notice that it keeps going up. It's not going down. Uh, and you might ask, you know, gosh, that's a lot of codes. Uh, aren't you done? You've been at this for 20 years. Um, Clem thought he would be done, right? Stan, you thought you, thought you might be done by this point. Um, but the reality of the situation is that stuff keeps changing. Um, there's a constant evolution in technology and diagnostics, as many of you know very well. Um, there's, there's always more tests. There's more genetic testing, just weird, wild ways, things you couldn't have imagined um, before. So that is happening, continues to happen. There's new ways um, to uh, represent uh, muted patients on themes, but there's also new areas where people didn't previously record data in an electronic format. They maybe had paper forms, they had just narrative text, and sort of increasingly those areas are coming to want to capture information at a more structured, discrete level. Uh, and with that then comes this need for sort of terminology. And so um, there's sort of evolution happening when things start out maybe as narrative report and then they begin getting more discrete, discretized. And we've, we've you know, been seeing that in genetic testing as well. Um, but then uh, there are other kinds of uses where people are starting to do different kinds of exchange. And so document titles, radiology reports have, have kind of always been there, but they're picking up steam as far as what people um, are trying to do with them and how they're trying to exchange and who they're trying to exchange with. Um, and so they keep asking us for more codes. Um, so how is new content added? We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later. And I'll give you sort of the we'll wrap up our session today with a nice sort of summary on how you can make uh, requests. But the, 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 the take home message is that it grows because you're, you ask. It doesn't grow because we make up new codes. I mean, it does, but we only make up new codes when you ask for them. <laughs> Uh, we're not sort of out um, uh, scouring the interwebs for new, you know, testing. It's only when somebody comes to us with a need that, uh, an interoperability need that says, I'd like, you know, one code because I want to share data with somebody. And that's how we, that's how we create the codes. So we distribute on the website uh, the standard. Obviously, um, you have probably been there. Um, so there's a couple of different packages you can get kind of the LOINC database itself, which is the table, the content, the records of uh, identifiers, as well as the Realm of Software program, which we're going to spend a lot of time going through today, um, and, and some other accessory files. So the LOINC table, you might think of this, this is the kind of the main portion, the meat uh, of the standard, and it contains essentially uh, one record per term. So it's organized like each record is a term in the database, and each term has a number of different attributes defined for it. In addition to the code and the name, there are alternate names, display names. Um, there's a class uh, assigned to it. There's example units of measure. There's some categorizations. We'll talk about many of these things in, in much more detail later. Um, but there's many, many attributes sort of associated with each term record in there. And while you might not have noticed it, or might not be apparent at first glance, uh, we're building sort of a, a reference library to help users make sense of and understand the LOINC content. And so increasingly, LOINC is sort of becoming like a little encyclopedia of tests and measures because um, the end goal is we want people to be able to choose wisely which codes they're dealing with. And sometimes you got to have a narrative description to understand what this thing is. Um, so our LOINC content developers spend a lot of their time, energy, and effort into crafting uh, some, some descriptive statements and summary about what this test or measurement is. Um, in order to help people when they're looking at each of those records figure out if they should link up their code to this one or not. Um, and that wasn't something we anticipated in the earliest days of LOINC necessarily needing. We thought if we made a great name, everybody would know what it meant. 
Um, and then when you realize that you don't even know what it meant, uh, when you're looking back 20 years later, uh, that's when the value of more rich narrative uh, and actually many of these other attributes that have expanded over time that we collect, those things come to play and give you context for understanding um, the, uh, the, the intention and design or what that concept represented or does represent. So there's the main database, the record per, per term, and then there's a set of accessory files. So um, I'll describe them briefly. We're not actually going to spend a ton of time digging into them. Um, we can maybe save that for um, uh, you know, advanced uh, discussion or if we, if we ever create an advanced tutorial, we'll go through some of these in detail. On the clinical side, the ones that pertain to some clinical elements uh, of LOINC, we do discuss in more detail in our special topics, tutorials on the clinical side. Um, so what are these accessory files? So one of them is the, uh, the panels and forms file. And this, uh, this file basically gives you the hierarchical structure of a collector term and its enumerated child elements. And uh, this works across both lab and clinical content. But on the clinical side, there are things like survey instruments that have a lot of cool, interesting, complicated metadata about them. And this structure includes all those sort of accessory attributes to help you understand them as well. And it connects the individual questions to uh, answer lists or choices of answer values. So this is a three-part sort of file that defines that structure. There is another file called the document ontology file, which is a set of detailed naming conventions for clinical document titles. So these are things like um, discharge summaries, um, progress notes, um, uh, various evaluation visit notes, and so forth. And there's a sort of detailed ontology organizing that content. It's a huge uh, ongoing topic of conversation on the clinical side. Um, there is a multi-axial hierarchy, which is a file that organizes long terms based on one or more of their attributes, their axes. That's why it's called multi-axial, because it's taking um, uh, more than one of the axes, which we'll cover in a second, organizing them. Um, there is a mapping file of uh, link to IEEE uh, medical device codes. This is part of our um, official collaboration with IEEE. This is one of the newer additions to our link distribution. Another new distribution addition is the link RCNA radiology playbook file. This represents also a detailed uh, breakdown of radiology procedure codes and the attributes that we use to construct them. So attributes like naming the modality, naming the anatomic region, naming the views. Muted. Sort of a detailed structure representing those different attributes that's available in this, in this file. And then lastly, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow as well. It's part of our ongoing collaboration with the IHTSDO. Um, there's a, uh, a file that integrates um, LOINC codes and and, and their corresponding SNMA CT expression. So the association between expression of individual SNMA CT concepts that put together have the same meaning as a LOINC code, um, as well as mappings between LOINC parts, the individual attributes of the LOINC term and SNMA CT concepts um, is also in uh, this file as well. So there's a lot of detail here. Hopefully you didn't get lost, uh, but this is sort of advanced user stuff um, but I wanted to highlight this is all actually part of our main distribution. So there's content and then there's tools. I uh, tried from the very beginning because we recognized that uh, Blink is only good if people are using it. So when we distribute the standard, we want to distribute tools that help people put it, put it to use. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot that we've sort of focused on and built up. The sort of flagship thing that we'll spend much of the day digging into is the Realma desktop mapping application. So this is a, a software program uh, that uh, has been around for a long time, it keeps getting better and better, and it helps you link your local terms to long terms. Uh, there's also an online search app, uh, which you can go to search.lunk.org, uh, and it's kind of like a, a simpler version of Realma. It doesn't have mapping capabilities, but it's got good lookup capabilities. Um, there are community resources, there's reference material, and then there's some other link related software um, that, uh, that we, we publish as well. Um, but putting some of these key tools together uh, and using them today is going to be our focus, as I mentioned, for the rest 
uh, the rest of the session today once we get past this sort of overview point. The last thing I want to mention before we pause for a second and I'll ask uh, for questions, stress breaks, and so forth, is to cover sort of the, uh, the legal stuff. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, I'm not pretending to be one, um, so this is my layman summary of the one license, um, which uh, is not true. That's actually not really what it says. Um, copyright, uh, as you might know, is actually a good thing for standards. You want your standards to be copyrighted um, because what it does is it protects them against multiple derivations from emerging. You want there to be one and only one thing if you're going to call that the standard. Um, but the licensing part obviously is the, the thing that can be tricky, confusing for users, and our goal is to make it sort of simple and, and um, be consistent with this goal of Lunk being used widely. So the license says that uh, you can use Lunk, it's available at no cost, uh, you can use it worldwide uh, in perpetuity. So going forward, what can you use it for? You can you can Muted. put it in your system, you can copy it, you can distribute it, you could put it on your website if you really wanted to. Um, uh, you can do that for any purpose, both commercial uh, or non-commercial. So you can uh, use it locally within your healthcare institution. You can build software products that would include Link inside, like my iPhone, um, or any uh, vended products, uh, and and that's all good. The license encourages translation into other languages, and we've set up some um, uh, sort of working processes to help encourage and facilitate that. Um, as you see, um, it's uh, it's borne out in, in a number of different translations already. Um, but there's one main provision in the license for what you can't do with LOINC. And that is you can't use LOINC or any of the stuff that we put out, the license material, to develop or promulgate a different standard for orders or observations. Um, and why? It seems sort of obvious, but that would defeat the entire purpose of having a standard. So you can't take LOINC, delete all the LOINC codes, uh, put your own codes there and call it, you know, better link or, you know, awesome terminology or whatever, um, you know, that would defeat the purpose of having something to start with. Uh, so, uh, so that's why that's in, that's why that's in the license. So let me...